Now, President Trump is often included in the strongman era of global leadership, alongside names such as Putin and President Erdogan of Turkey. Erdogan was a modernizing, democratizing leader at first, before descending into increasingly authoritarian ways. From purging dozens of thousands of civil servants and judges after a failed coup in 2016, to cracking down on the country's free press. Turkey's economy has since spiraled, but now Istanbul has triggered a political earthquake, voting in favor of the opposition party in a rerun election for mayor of the city. It was David versus Goliath. It is the first time in 25 years that Erdogan's party will not control the city. The new mayor, Ekrem Imamulu, framed his campaign as a fight for democracy. And he tells me that he is not about to confront Erdogan head on, but he is warning that democracy can no longer be stolen from the people. Mayor Imamulu, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. It is an incredible situation. You won in the first round with a small fraction, a small percentage. Then the vote was, was challenged and you had to run again, and you won by a huge margin in the second round. Do you think even more people came out because they were angry that your first win was annulled? Before March 31st, the first election, we were presented with circumstances that gave us difficulties in promoting ourselves. Subsequent to March 31st, perhaps all those difficulties, negativities, we've had the opportunity to reach everyone, every color, every political personality living in Istanbul, and tell them about our approach to democracy and our vision as a whole. Although we have not been able to level the conditions, we were able to raise our conditions a bit. In my opinion, the people of Istanbul were able to cast their vote more freely. I do not believe that it can be described solely as an angry reaction. It was way more than that. In my view, what had an effect on Istanbul was their belief in democracy and the continuity of democracy. The people of Istanbul demonstrated the legitimacy of the election, and the election was protected. No one will be able to interfere with elections to such an extent again. Mr. Mayor, you keep talking about democracy, and that is why so many people around the world are interested in this result. Even though you are the mayor of Istanbul, democracy, many would say, has been compromised over the last many years. You have many journalists in jail, many civil servants in jail, many judges. Some are accused of partaking in, in, a, in the coup but others are just being thrown into jail because of opposition to the ruling Erdogan party. Can your victory change any of that? Can you bring back at least some democracy into the, uh, the, the public domain? That was its biggest contribution. As well as our election, this has turned into a valuable test. At the same time, the Istanbul election and the test of democracy serve to refresh the hopes of Generation Z. I witness and feel that mostly in the youth. The illegal, unlawful, undemocratic period subsequent to March 31st, and the fact that it was corrected by the citizens, the people themselves, in my view, is an exemplary one for the rest of the world. June 23rd was an important test, and the result was a success. Just explain to me about your campaign, because you've written about it, and it's a very unusual campaign. Instead of mass big rallies and access to state media, you did a much more, in, a, in the West we say, retail politics. You talked to hundreds of thousands of, of citizens. What was your campaign exactly? It was an organic campaign. It was completely true. It was based on making physical contact and forming dialogue with the people. That is because the channels of communication in Turkey are rather closed to the opposition. I was able to appear on the state television channel only once, and that was three days before the second election on June 23rd. That was the situation we faced as the opposition. In complete contrast, the other candidate had every means to communicate as he wished. That meant we had no choice but to cover distances, districts, streets. That meant working 17 to 18 hours a day, a six-month-long panting campaign. We formed dialogues and achieved access. I believe we ran an extraordinary digital campaign, too. 
The one-to-one -one campaigning model is thousands of years old. We achieved that here in the 21st century, both physically in the streets and also in digital platforms and over social media. We used a political, nonpartisan language. We reached out to all political parties, not just to the Republican People's Party and our ally, the Good Party. We promised that we would be completely transparent and we would include everyone in the process. Mr. Mayor, your slogan was, everything will be fine. And that's a pretty hopeful slogan. It's very different for Turkey. But I wonder whether you are concerned that actually things might not be so fine. And President Erdogan, who suffered a massive humiliation by this loss, having forced a rerun, having seen you win by even more than you won the first time round, whether he will try to interfere with what you want to do, whether he will try to subvert your plans. What do you expect from President Erdogan going forward now? June 23rd showed us that no one, no individual or power can stand in the way of the will of the people. No politician has the luxury to ignore that fact. They are going to see it. In my speech on the night of the election, when I declared that I had won the election, I also declared that I had opened all doors wide and that I wanted to provide services jointly. I made the call to the Mr. President, the head of the state, to that end. I made the same call to other politicians as well. Serving a city cannot be restricted to a political party or certain politics. That process ended with the end of the election process. The needs and expectations of the citizens then take priority. This is what democracies require too. I promised that I would implement that promise without fault. I then also said the following. Whoever decides not to serve the people and prioritizes their political future instead, I would make it known and unveil it using transparency. That is not a threat, it is how things should be. There is an extraordinary sense of longing for democracy here, and a mass of people who take ownership of it. Therefore, if Mr. Erdogan, he was elected one year ago, he has more than four years ahead of him. We have just been elected and we have five years ahead of us. Turning this process into a race for serving the people would leave more positive notes in the memories of the people. Opting for the opposite would have a negative effect on the political futures of the people. My expectation is that Mr. Erdogan will respond positively to our call. Well, look, I see you uh, extending a hand of peace and goodwill to President Erdogan. But he has also said in the past, and remember, of course, he was famously mayor of Istanbul, that whoever wins Istanbul wins Turkey. He considers this position vital. You will now have access to all the city records, and there have been many allegations of cronyism and corruption within the Erdogan regime. Should he fear that the new mayor, you, will launch investigations um, into alleged corruption, cronyism, which, of course, he's denied all these years? I would first like to express my approach to politics. More than my or my party's victory in Istanbul, what I have in my mind is the victory of Turkey. Victory by a country must be more valuable than victory by an individual or a party. Right now I'm talking about plans to make Turkey win. Extending the hand for peace would be to the benefit of the country. I will persist on that. On the other hand, I will never extend my hand for peace in a secret room behind doors. I will do it in front of the public. I want people to see which hand is being extended and which hand is being rejected in the most transparent way. So, so just lastly, do you plan to investigate um, the allegations against him? Yani... That, of course, is not my responsibility, not my job. That is a judicial process. But any troubling situation in Istanbul, and I would not, of course, know if such issues would relate to Mr. Erdogan as an individual or not, and I would not want to think that they would be. But I am the mayor of Istanbul, and any negativity that is present in Istanbul, any transaction counter to the benefit of the people, will most certainly be investigated and scrutinized. We are going to subject the corporate structure of the Greater Istanbul Municipality and the financial organization of all of its companies to the scrutiny of auditing companies with international expertise. This was our promise to the people and we are going to fulfill it as soon as we return to the office. 
Istanbul is an international city, and we want it to have ties with Europe and the rest of the world, which is very important for us. I do not think this is related to Mr. Erdogan as an individual. They may relate to his party or to the administrators of his party. How the process would progress is a matter for the judiciary, not my personal responsibility, of course. Mayor Ekrem Imomulu, thank you so much indeed for joining me. And I thank you. Do continue to follow Turkey and its democracy. No doubt everything will be fine. And that's your slogan. Thank you very much. And Turkey is, of course, a major NATO and U.S. ally. And a shift in the country's domestic policies could have a significant impact on foreign policy in the region. Kori Shaki is Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies here in London. And she's joining me now. Welcome back to the program. It's a great pleasure. I and mean, you see he's very... Uh friendly man and knows how to throw around a slogan and again said everything is fine. I mean, he's, 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 got, he's got the touch. Yeah, and I thought it was extraordinarily positive that he's not focusing on settling scores, that he's emphasizing what his job is, not the judiciary's job, which is not only good for the people of Istanbul, but also likely to diminish the prospects that President Erdogan will try and seek revenge for losing Istanbul. I mean, just before we get to what ripple effect this could have, I mean, what, do you, what impact do you think it will have on President Erdogan, the fact that he publicly called for this election to be rerun, he dismissed um, Imamulu's first victory and delivered him a victory massively bigger in the second round? There's no way around the fact that it's an enormous political defeat for President Erdogan and the first one that he's experienced in his time in power, having started out as mayor of Istanbul, then become prime minister, and then got the constitution changed to give the president the powers uh, that he has been exercising. I really thought it was important that you emphasize the repressive nature of Turkey under President Erdogan and that they have the highest number of journalists in prison of any country in the world. I think that's a good metric for just how authoritarian Turkey has become. So then the next question obviously is what can a mayor do in the face of a president uh, who, who runs most of the policies, as you say, he took constitutional changes to make that happen, despite how important Istanbul is, and that he has the, really the people behind him. I mean, could this be the earthquake that some are saying it is? Uh, a big reason why President Erdogan is still in power is the weak and divisive nature of the opposition. And so the new mayor of Istanbul, as we just saw, he's so hopeful, he's so dedicated. If he is able to govern that way, he can rebuild the strength of the opposition party, and that would that would discipline President Erdogan enormously. See, that's interesting, because he did actually reach out, as he said, to, to all the opposition parties. And he got, you know, not a coalition, but he got everybody sort of on board, as it, it seems to be. Um, what about the impact on authoritarianism, not just in Turkey, but as an example of potentially a backlash in grassroots politics against what we've been seeing and the populism that some say, you know, Erdogan himself you know, embodied ever since 2016 at least. Yeah, I hope it's a sign that the the cracking down and the, the drift towards authoritarianism that Freedom House and other good NGOs have, have marked for us all over the last several years is being pushed back. I mean, between the election in Istanbul and the protests in Hong Kong, it's been a good few weeks for people demanding that their government respond to their desires. It's really fascinating, actually. But now let's talk about the impact on the United States, on NATO, uh, in the region. Presumably, President Erdogan will maybe try, at least in the beginning, to shift more exclusive, exclusively towards foreign policy. How does this mayoral vote affect, impact Turkish relations with the US? I agree with your judgment. I think it's likely to make him try and be more active on foreign and defense policy because that that's a space where he can continue to show his control over politics in Turkey. And Turkey has a lot of problems on its plate right now. Uh, Syria, the, they had been opposed to Bashar al-Assad remaining in power, and Bashar al-Assad remains in power. They had been supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood and 
in Egypt. Mohamed Morsi died in captivity uh, last week. They have taken Qatar's side in the dispute among, amongst the Gulf states, even sent troops to Qatar. Uh, and then in the difficulties of their relationship with the United States. President Erdogan seems to get along very well with President Trump. In fact, they seem to have very similar reflexes. And, and yet, Turkey's purchase of the A-400, excuse me, the S-400 Russian air defense system has caused the American Defense Department to exclude them from the F-35 program. Well, let's just talk about that because there's a lot of acronyms and missiles and aircraft that you're talking about. Why, why, why does this matter right now? And obviously, President Trump and President Erdogan presumably are going to meet at the upcoming G20 summit. Um, and President Trump has threatened sanctions if Turkey goes ahead and buys a miss missile system from Russia. Why is Turkey even doing that? It's a NATO ally. Uh, the Russian S-400 air defense system is a pretty good system. We're anxious about what it can, the way it can endanger American fighter planes. And NATO has an integrated air defense system, so we can't fold the Russian system into the NATO system without compromising all of the intelligence information. So compromising the defensive capabilities and offensive capabilities of the F-35 fighter and other fighters. Turkey has already bought the S-400 system. They begin to be delivered in July. Uh, at the NATO defense minister's meeting in Brussels today, there was another dust-up between the U.S. Defense Sec acting defense secretary and his Turkish counterpart over this. The United States has started excluding Turkish pilots from the training program for the F-35. This is a really serious problem. And what could the impact be? I mean, I want to get to Iran in a second, but very quickly, since Turkey knows that, why would it go and gum up the works by buying a Russian system? It knows that it can't integrate it, uh, and it's a NATO ally. And what impact would it have excluding Turkey from these vital training programs and, and, and NATO missions? Yeah, I think that... I think my guess is that initially it started off as a way to leverage the United States to provide cheaper, better systems to Turkey, and things picked up momentum, and then honor got involved, and, and now it's a big mess. Like, my back's in a corner and you're not going to tell me what to do. And, and, and it is a big mess. Do you think the Iran situation is a big mess? We've had back and forth threats. Uh, we've had the activity in the Persian Gulf. We've had the president who was going to launch something, then standing back. We've had uh, outbursts from Iran, from both the president, Hassan Rouhani, in response to new American sanctions, and, in fact, from the leader, the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, who also was personally sanctioned by the U.S. He said today in a tweet, if you surrender to them, the United States, you are done. Where is this headed well, we are certainly seeing a ratcheting up of tensions between the U.S. and Iran, and also a much higher likelihood of an incident like the shootdown of the drone spinning out of control. Uh, President Trump's policy is wildly inconsistent, a maximum pressure campaign that that would lead toward the use of military enforcement that the president backed away from at the last minute. It makes it very difficult to manage a crisis if your adversary doesn't know, doesn't have a sense of what your reactions are going to be. It makes it harder for allies to be able to coordinate their policy with your policy. So we're seeing a lot of mixed messages out of the Trump administration. And President Trump said the following about his intentions, uh, just, just this, this is his latest. We're in a very strong position. If, we, if something should happen, we're in a very strong position. It wouldn't last very long, I can tell you that. It would not last very long. And I'm not talking boots on the ground. I'm not talking we're going to send uh, a million soldiers. I'm just saying if something would happen, it wouldn't last very long. I mean, your reaction to that, and also, can Turkey talk to the U.S. about this? Can it be a mediator since Turkey gets on very well with Iran? I doubt Turkey can mediate this, given the amount of tension there is in the U.S.-Turkish relationship right now. And the Trump administration, you know, they pointed a gun at Iran's head, then declined to pull the trigger. So it's a very unstable situation, in part because the Iranians are taking advantage and doing a lot of dangerous things, and the Trump administration isn't reacting effectively. What do you think it should do? 
Uh, I think it shouldn't threaten to use force if the president's actually not going to do it. We've now seen this in North Korea. We've also seen it in Iran. It makes it very difficult to deter countries when the president sets up policies that require the use of force, then backs away. I think he should actually build policies that don't require the use of force if he's not willing to go there. Corey Shaki, thank you so much indeed. Now, one of the big reasons for President Erdogan's defeat, as we discussed, is Turkey's economic crisis. And we turn now to a conversation about the state of the global economy. Harvard professor Gita Gopinath is the first female chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. And she talked dollars and cents with our Walter Isaacson, as well as her personal journey growing up in India.